Bonds are some of the most popular investments out there. They appeal to a wide variety of investors, but especially those who are starting to near financial independence. And it's easy to see why. Historically, bonds have done a good job of balancing out the volatility of stocks. For instance, during the Great Depression of the early 1930s, bonds grew by approximately 5.4% per year. Sure, that may not sound like much, but it is considerably better than the negative 24.5% per year that the stock market fell during that time. However, recently some investors have begun to call into question the viability of bonds going forward. There are a few reasons for this. First, the returns of bonds have historically been correlated with the changes in interest rates. When interest rates rise, the returns of bonds generally fall, and vice versa. Currently, of course, rates are about as low as they've ever been, so the theory is that they've got nowhere to go but up in the future. Maybe not immediately, as the Fed has suggested that they don't intend to raise rates anytime soon, but eventually, because at least in theory, again, they can't go much lower. Second, during this most recent economic downturn and the large amount of government stimulus that came with it, the average person's savings rate has jumped to much higher than normal levels. This means that there's a lot of cash waiting to be released into the wider economy, and once we're able to get back to something approaching normal, that increased money supply in active circulation could lead to rising levels of inflation, which will lower the real returns experienced by bonds. And third, the returns of bonds over the last several years have not been nearly as impressive as other assets like stocks. So basically, the thinking is that we've been in what should be a bond-friendly environment for the last several years, with very low interest rates and low inflation, but the returns have not been anything to write home about. And there's a chance that the environment of the future will not be quite as bond-friendly as what we have now. Therefore, one would expect the returns for bonds would continue to be less than stellar. So does that mean that bonds are likely to be bad investments going forward? To answer that, let's look at history to see what happens to bonds during times when interest rates, and even inflation, are on the rise. Let's compare how the performance of those bonds stack up to other investments like stocks, and let's see if, once the cycle is complete, there's actually still a place for bonds in a modern portfolio. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. So today we're going to be looking at eight different time frames when interest rates and occasionally inflation was on the rise, to see how the performance of bonds stack up to the performance of stocks. To find the performance of bonds, we're going to be looking at the bond market as a whole, as opposed to specific segments of it like treasuries, tips, or corporate bonds. And for stocks, we'll be looking at a large cap blend index fund, like the S&P 500. The time frames we'll be using are 1959 to 1960, 1962 to 1967, 1972 to 1974, 1977 to 1980. 1985 to 1987, 1994 to 1997, 2004 to 2007, and 2015 to 2019. We'll be looking at the inflation-adjusted growth of each investment over those time frames, of course, but in addition to that, we'll also check in to see what the returns were one and two years after the interest rates stopped rising to get a better idea of what a full cycle looks like. We'll also be looking into other metrics like standard deviation, start date sensitivity, and how badly the investments crashed to get a fuller picture of what the investing experience might have been like for each asset. So as you can see on your screen now, the real returns of bonds have typically clocked in at around 3% or less per year. In some cases, cases like in the late 1950s and 2010s, and in the early and late 1970s, the returns failed to keep pace with inflation. The periods in the 1970s are somewhat understandable, as there were market recessions, rising interest rates, and sustained levels of high inflation all at the same time, so most investments struggled during those years, but it is still worth mentioning. In the years following interest rate peaks, bonds have typically performed better, as we would expect given how the returns have historically been correlated with interest rate changes. In these scenarios, the inflation-adjusted returns returns often clocked in at around the 4 to 7% per year range. The standard deviation of bonds returns only rose above the 10% mark once, which occurred in the 1977 to 1981 period. For the most part, the standard deviation during years with rising rates stayed at or below 5%, which is very stable as far as investments are concerned. The start date sensitivity numbers tell a very similar story, with the highest mark coming in at 7.2% during that 1977-81 period, suggesting that in order to get those returns, you don't have to be particularly lucky by investing your money at the right time. And finally, when bonds did fail to keep pace with inflation, the crashes rarely went deeper than 5 or 6% below their all-time inflation-adjusted highs. The only time when that did occur was between 1977 and 1981, when it fell 26% below previous inflation-adjusted highs. However, inflation during those years totaled 47%, 
In nominal terms, the bonds never actually lost money during those years. In fact, they grew by 16, 3, 1, 2, and 3% respectively. So it is a loss, but it's a loss that's entirely due to inflation. If you had been investing in bonds during that time and your personal inflation rate didn't match up with the CPI, which is the case for a lot of people, for better and for worse, then you may or may not have experienced a noticeable downturn individually. Comparing these results to the ones produced by large cap stocks, we see a pretty noticeable difference in a few areas. The first, of course, is returns. As you can see on your screen now, the real return of large cap stocks have varied quite a bit more than bonds, but have been higher on average. They typically clock in at around 7-8% per year. And the only period where it failed to keep pace with inflation was from 1972 to 1974, when it trailed it by around 5.4% per year. That's pretty impressive, all things considered. However, in the years following interest rate peaks, we see the reverse pattern playing out that we saw in bonds. Stocks have actually typically performed worse following interest rate peaks than they do when they're on the rise. Again, the returns vary a lot more than they do for bonds, but the average inflation-adjusted return for large cap stocks in the year following rate peaks is about 4%, and they actually fail to keep pace with inflation in three of the eight instances we're looking at, sometimes by more than 30%, such as what happened in 1975. If we look two years out, the story is a little bit better, but still similar, with average real returns coming in at around 6% per year, with annualized drops as high as 20%, which happened following the 2007 peak. The standard deviation of stock returns is naturally much higher than for bonds rising above 10% in half of the scenarios, with two more clocking in at 9%. The wildest period was in the 1960s, with a standard deviation of returns of nearly 28%. So obviously in terms of consistency, it's not that great. But we all knew that stocks were volatile, so that's not really news. However, the start date sensitivity numbers tell a different story, with the highest mark coming in at just 6.2% during these periods. That mark came during the 1972-74 period, suggesting that while stocks are volatile in the short term, if you're willing to ride the waves, the luck required to earn those returns are not too different from bonds at least in the years where interest rates are rising. That's a very important thing to point out. We're looking at a very specific, small segment of history today. Finally, when large cap stocks did fail to keep pace with inflation, which didn't happen too often when rates were on the rise, the crashes went deeper than they did for bonds on average, but the worst crashes weren't actually quite as deep. The worst inflation-adjusted crash for stocks during the years we're examining today clocked in at 22% during the early 1970s. Again, most of that was due to the effects of inflation, which rose some 16% during that span. Stocks did fall by a nominal 15% between 1973 and 74, but grew the rest of the time. So in the end, it seems that during periods of rising interest rates, stocks do perform better than bonds in terms of growth, which is not all that surprising as stocks tend to outperform bonds over the long haul in general in terms of growth. That's not to say that bonds have no merit, as they did tend to deliver more consistent returns than stocks, and they rarely fell in value by very much, which tends to make them a lot more appealing to some investors who are nearing financial independence or retirement, as they don't have quite as many years to recover from a major downturn, but again, we already knew that. What is interesting to note is that bonds have actually beaten out stocks about as often as stocks have beaten out bonds in terms of growth in the year or two following interest rate peaks, suggesting that even in isolation, bonds may not be a total lost cause in situations where you expect rates to rise. But the reality for most investors is that bonds are not held in isolation. Sure, some people will have all bond portfolios, just like some will have all stock portfolios. But most people will have at least some of both. So when we're asking, are bonds bad investments when we expect rates to rise in the future, what we should really be asking is, do bonds still serve the role that they were meant to play as part of a larger portfolio? Which is not to grow our nest egg at a rapid pace, but to balance out the worst tendencies of our actual growth instrument, stocks. If we look at a classic 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, using the same investments as before, we see that the answer to the question appears to be a pretty resounding yes. The growth figures and standard deviation of returns of the portfolio fall somewhere in between the all stock and all bond figures we saw earlier, as we would expect given that we're now mixing the two. But the start date sensitivity and maximum crash depth figures are actually the best of the three approaches. The start date sensitivity figures never rose higher than 5.4% during these 
years we're examining today. And they were actually below 1% more often than any other range, and more often than stocks or bonds alone. This suggests that of the three approaches, the mixed portfolio is the least luck-based. The worst crash clocked in at around 15%, which still occurred between 1972 and 74. Remember though that inflation rose by 16% during those years, so that drop was again largely due to inflation, not the falling value of your investments. So in the end, are bonds bad investments? Well, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your investments. If you're prioritizing growth above all else, and you've got both the ability to ride the waves as they happen and the time to recover from them before withdrawing your money, then bonds probably aren't going to be the first option on your list. When interest rates rise, their returns do tend to fall to a degree. But even when rates aren't actively rising, their long-term growth figures are not what draws people to invest in bonds. It's their consistency, it's their dependability, their tranquility, and above all else, their ability to stabilize the growth portion of your portfolio enough to make you more comfortable investing the bulk of your money into that portion in the first place, without putting yourself in some sort of situation where you'll be tempted to shoot yourself in the foot at the worst possible time. Now those benefits are going to be more relevant to some people than others, so as with every investment it would seem that the answer is they're good for the right person in the right situation, while others who won't get as much benefit from bonds given their individual makeup and situation, the lacking growth figures would probably be too much to give up. Oh, and just as a quick afterthought, because I have seen a few people mention this as a possible alternative, would gold actually be a good substitute for bonds in that 60-40 portfolio mix? I ran the numbers for the same time periods we've covered today, and it seems that they are close in some respects, but there are a few caveats to mention. The first is that while growth during rising interest rate environments does appear to be higher with a stock gold mix than a stock bond mix, you don't get quite the same type of strong rebound following rate peaks. And truth be told, much of that extra growth actually came from those periods in the 1970s and early 1980s when the price of gold was skyrocketing after the US went off of the gold standard. You could argue that that specific period was a little bit of an anomaly for gold since its price had been previously fixed for many years, so I'm not entirely sure how much of that excess growth could be counted on in the future. Additionally, the advantages we saw bonds give us in terms of stabilizing our returns and making them less luck-based seems to get lost when substituting gold. To put hard numbers to it, the highest start date sensitivity for the stock gold mix was 11.7%, which is considerably higher than any of the other three approaches we looked at today. And that was just one of three instances where the start date sensitivity was at or above 6%. Remember, we're only looking at 8 instances here in total, so it seems that dependability of returns is not a strong suit of this particular mix during these situations. Finally, while the maximum crash depth of the stock gold mix is about the same as the stock bond mix, roughly 15%, but this time occurring in the mid-1980s, when there wasn't quite as high of inflation to blame for the drop, it does tend to crash a little more frequently during these situations. Granted, this is a very small sample size, so we do have to take this with a grain of salt, but based on the data we have, it doesn't seem to give us much of a noticeable edge here. So on the whole, I'd say that it seems as if gold fills a role in a portfolio, but it's a different role than the one that bonds plays. You can't just substitute one in for the other and expect to get the same benefits. They both have their own strengths and weaknesses. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.